Next evening, the girl ushered her aunt into Toad's cell, bearing his week's washing pinned up in a towel. The old lady had been prepared beforehand for the interview, and the sight of certain gold sovereigns that Toad had thoughtfully placed on the table in full view practically completed the matter and left little further to discuss. In return for his cash, Toad received a cotton print gown, an apron, a shawl, and a rusty black bonnet. The only stipulation the old lady made being that she should be gagged and bound and dumped down in a corner. By this not very convincing artifice, she hoped to retain her situation in spite of the suspicious appearance of things. Toad was delighted with the suggestion. It would enable him to leave the prison in some style, and with his reputation for being a desperate and dangerous fellow untarnished, and he readily helped the jailer's daughter to make her aunt appear as much as possible the victim of circumstances over which she had no control. Now it's your turn, Toad, said the girl. Take off that coat and waistcoat of yours. You're fat enough as it is. Shaking with laughter, she proceeded to hook and eye him into the cotton print gown, arranged the shawl with a professional fold, and tied the strings of the rusty bonnet under his chin. <laughs> You're the very image of her, she giggled. Only I'm sure you've never looked half so respectable in all your life before. Now goodbye, Toad, and good luck. Go straight down the way you came up. With a quaking heart, but as firm a footstep as he could command, Toad set forth cautiously on what seemed to be a most harebrained and hazardous undertaking. But he was soon agreeably surprised to find how easy everything was made for him. The washerwoman's squat figure in its familiar cotton print seemed a passport for every barred door and grim gateway. It seemed hours before he crossed the last courtyard, but at last he heard the wicket gate in the great outer door click behind him, felt the fresh air of the outer world upon his anxious brow, and knew that he was free. Dizzy with the easy success of his daring exploit, he walked quickly towards the lights of the town. His attention was caught by some red and green lights a little way off to one side of the town, and the sound of the puffing and snorting of engines, and the banging of shunted trucks fell on his ear. Aha! he thought. This is a piece of luck. A railway station is the thing I want most in the whole world at this moment. He made his way to the station accordingly, consulted a timetable, and found that a train bound more or less in the direction of his home was due to start in half an hour. More luck, said Toad, his spirits rising rapidly, and went off to the booking office to buy his ticket. He gave the name of the station that he knew to be nearest to the village of which Toad Hall was the principal feature, and mechanically put his fingers, in search of the necessary money, where his waistcoat pocket should have been, and found not only no money, but no pocket to hold it, and no waistcoat to hold the pocket. To his horror, he recollected that he had left both coat and waistcoat behind him in his cell, and with them his pocketbook, money, keys, watch, matches, pencil case. In his misery, he made one desperate effort to carry the thing off, and with a return to his fine old manner, he said, Look here, I find I've left my purse behind. Just give me that ticket, will you, and I'll send the money on tomorrow. I'm well known in these parts. The clerk stared at him and the rusty black bonnet a moment, and then laughed. I should think you were pretty well known in these parts, he said, if you tried this game on often. Here, stand away from the window, please, madam. You're obstructing the other passengers. An old gentleman, who had been prodding him in the back for some moments, here thrust him away and what was worse, addressed him as his good woman, which angered Toad more than anything that had occurred that evening. Baffled and full of despair, he wandered blindly down the platform where the train was standing, and tears trickled down each side of his nose. Very soon his escape would be discovered, the hunt would be up, he would be caught, reviled, loaded with chains, dragged back again to prison and bread and water and straw. What was to be done? As he pondered, he found himself opposite the engine, which was being oiled, wiped, and generally caressed by its affectionate driver, a burly man with an oil can in one hand and a lump of cotton waste in the other. Hello, mother, said the engine driver. What's the trouble? You don't look particularly cheerful. Oh, sir, said Toad, crying afresh. I am a poor, unhappy washerwoman, and I've lost all my money and can't pay for a ticket and I must get home tonight somehow, and whatever I am to do, I don't know. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. That's a bad business indeed, said the engine driver reflectively. 
lost your money and can't get home. And got some kids too waiting for you, I dare say. Any amount of them, sobbed Toad. And they'll be hungry and playing with matches and, and upsetting lamps, the little innocents, and quarrelling and going on generally. Oh dear, oh dear. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, said the good engine driver. You're a washerwoman to your trade, says you. Very well, that's that. And I'm an engine driver, as you well may see. And there's no denying it's terribly dirty work. Uses up a power of shirts, it does, till my missus is fair tired of washing them. If you wash a few shirts for me when you get home and send them along, I'll give you a ride on my engine. It's against the company's regulations, but we're not so very particular in these out-of-the-way parts. The toad's misery turned into rapture as he eagerly scrambled up into the cab of the engine. Of course, he had never washed a shirt in his life, and couldn't if he tried. Anyhow, he wasn't going to begin. But he thought, when I get safely home to Toad Hall and have money again, and pockets to put it in, I will send the engine driver enough to pay for quite a quantity of washing, and that'll be the same thing, or better. The guard waved his welcome flag. The engine driver whistled in cheerful response, and the train moved out of the station. As the speed increased, and the toad could see on either side of him real fields and trees and hedges and cows and horses all flying past him, and as he thought how every minute was bringing him nearer to Toad Hall, he began to skip up and down and shout and sing snatches of song to the great astonishment of the engine driver. They had covered many and many a mile, and Toad was already considering what he would have for supper as soon as he got home, when he noticed that the engine driver, with a puzzled expression on his face, was leaning over the side of the engine and listening hard. Then he saw him climb onto the coals and gaze out over the top of the train. Then he returned and said to Toad, That's very strange. We're the last train running in this direction tonight, yet I could be sworn that I heard another following us. I can see it clearly now. It is an engine on our rails, coming along at a great pace. It looks as if we were being pursued. The miserable Toad, crouching in the coal dust, tried hard to think of something to do with dismal want of success. They are gaining on us fast, cried the engine driver, and the engine is crowded with the queerest lot of people. Men like ancient warders waving halberds, policemen in their helmets waving truncheons, and shabbily dressed men in pot hats obvious and unmistakable plain clothes detectives, even at this distance, waving revolvers and walking sticks, all waving and all shouting the same thing. Stop, stop, stop. Then Toad fell on his knees among the coals, and raising his clasped paws in supplication, cried, Save me! Only save me, dear, kind Mr. Engine Driver, and I will confess everything. I am not the simple washerwoman I seem to be. I have no children waiting for me, innocent or otherwise. I am a toad, the well-known and popular Mr. Toad, a landed proprietor. I have just escaped by my great daring and cleverness from a loathsome dungeon into which my enemies had flung me. And if those fellows on that engine recapture me, it will be chains and bread and water and straw and misery once more for poor, unhappy, innocent toad. The engine driver looked down upon him very sternly and said, Now tell the truth. What were you put in prison for? It was nothing very much, said poor Toad, colouring deeply. I only borrowed a motor car while the owners were at lunch. They had no need of it at the time. I didn't mean to steal it, really. The engine driver looked very grave and said, I fear that you have been indeed a wicked Toad, and by rights I would have give you up to offended justice but you are evidently in sore trouble and distress, so I will not desert you. I don't hoe with motor cars, for one thing, and I don't hoe with being ordered about by policemen when I'm on my own engine for another. And the sight of an animal in tears always makes me feel queer and soft-hearted. So cheer up, Toad. I'll do my best, and we may beat them yet. They piled on more coals, shoveling furiously. The furnace roared, the sparks flew, the engine leaped and swung, but still their pursuers slowly gained. The engine driver, with a sigh, wiped his brow with a handful of cotton waste and said, I'm afraid it's no good, Toad. You see, they are running light and they have the better engine. There's just one thing left for us to do and it's your only chance. A short way ahead of us is a long tunnel and on the other side of that, the line passes through a thick wood. Now, 
I will put on all the speed I can while we are running through the tunnel, but the other fellows will slow down a bit naturally for fear of an accident. When we are through, I will shut off steam and put on brakes as hard as I can, and the moment it's safe to do so, you must jump and hide in the wood before they get through the tunnel and see you. Then I will go full speed ahead again, and they can chase me if they like, for as long as they like, and as far as I like. Now, mind and be ready to jump when I tell you. They piled on more coals, and the train shot into the tunnel, and the engine rushed and roared and rattled, till at last they shot out at the other end into fresh air and the peaceful moonlight, and saw the wood lying dark and helpful upon either side of the line. The driver shut off steam and put on brakes. The toad got down on the step, and as the train slowed down to almost a walking pace, he heard the driver call out, Now! Jump! Toad jumped, rolled down a short embankment, picked himself up unhurt, scrambled into the wood, and hid. Peeping out, he saw his train get up speed again and disappear at a great pace. Then out of the tunnel burst the pursuing engine, roaring and whistling, a motley crew waving their various weapons and shouting, Stop! 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 When they were past, the toad had a hearty laugh for the first time since he was thrown into prison. But he soon stopped laughing when he came to consider that it was now very late and dark and cold, and he was in an unknown wood, with no money and no chance of supper, and still far from friends and home. He dared not leave the shelter of the trees, so he struck into the wood with the idea of leaving the railway as far as possible behind him. At last, cold, hungry, and tired out, he sought the shelter of a hollow tree, where with branches and dead leaves he made himself as comfortable a bed as he could and slept soundly till the morning. The front door of the hollow tree faced eastwards, so Toad was called at an early hour, partly by the bright sunlight streaming in on him, partly by the exceeding coldness of his toes. Sitting up, he rubbed his eyes first and his complaining toes next, wondered for a moment where he was, looking round for familiar stone wall and little barred window, then, with a leap of the heart, remembered everything, his escape, his flight, his pursuit, remembered first and best thing of all, that he was free. He shook himself, combed the dry leaves out of his hair with his fingers, and marched forth into the comfortable morning sun, cold but confident, hungry but hopeful, all nervous terrors of yesterday dispelled by rest and sleep and frank and heartening sunshine. He had the world all to himself that early summer morning. The dewy woodland was solitary and still. The green fields that succeeded the trees were his own to do as he liked with. The road itself, when he reached it, in that loneliness that was everywhere, seemed like a stray dog to be looking anxiously for company. The reserved rustic road was presently joined by a shy little brother in the shape of a canal, which took its hand and ambled along by its side in perfect confidence, but with the same tongue-tied, uncommunicative attitude towards strangers. Bother them, said Toad to himself. But anyhow, one thing's clear. They must both be coming from somewhere and going to somewhere. You can't get over that, Toad, my boy. So he marched on patiently by the water's edge. Round a bend in the canal came plodding a solitary horse, stooping forward as if in anxious thought. From rope traces attached to his collar stretched a long line, taut but dipping with his stride, the further part of it dripping pearly drops. Toad let the horse pass and stood waiting for what the fates were sending him. With a pleasant swirl of quiet water at its blunt bow, a barge slid up alongside of him, its sole occupant a big stout woman wearing a linen sunbonnet, one brawny arm laid along the tiller. A nice morning, ma'am, she remarked to Toad as she drew up level with him. I dare say it is, ma'am, responded Toad politely as he walked along the towpath abreast of her. I dare say it is a nice morning to them that's not in sore trouble, like what I am. Here's my married daughter. She sends off to me post-haste to come to her at once. So off I comes, not knowing what may be happening or going to happen, but fearing the worst, as you will understand, ma'am, if you're a mother too. And I've left my business to look after itself. I'm in the washing and laundering line, you must know, ma'am. And I've left my young children to look after themselves. And a more mischievous and troublesome set of young imps doesn't exist, ma'am. 
and I've lost all my money and lost my way, and as for what may be happening to my married daughter, why, I don't like to think of it, ma'am. Where might your married daughter be living, ma'am? asked the barge-woman. She lives near the river, ma'am, replied Toad, close to a fine house called Toad Hall that's somewheres hereabouts in these parts. Perhaps you may have heard of it. Toad Hall? Well, I'm going that way myself, replied the barge-woman. This canal joins the river some miles further on, a little above Toad Hall, and then it's an easy walk. You come along in the barge with me, and I'll give you a lift. She steered the barge close to the bank, and Toad, with many humble and grateful acknowledgments, stepped lightly on board and sat down with great satisfaction. So you're in the washing business, ma'am, said the barge woman politely as they glided along. Finest business in the whole country, said Toad airily. All the gentry come to me, washing, ironing, clear starching, making up gents' fine shirts for evening wear. Everything's done under my own eye. And are you fond of washing? I love it, said Toad. I simply dote on it. Never so happy as when I've got both arms in the wash tub. What a bit of luck meeting you, observed the barge woman thoughtfully. A regular piece of good fortune for both of us. My husband, he's such a fellow for shirking his work and leaving the barge to me that never a moment do I get foreseen to my own affairs. By rights, he ought to be here now, either steering or attending to the horse, instead of which he's gone off with the dog to see if they can't pick up a rabbit for dinner somewhere. But meantime, how am I to get on with my washing? Oh, never mind about the washing, said Toad, not liking the subject. Try and fix your mind on that rabbit. A nice, fat young rabbit, I'll be bound. I can't fix my mind on anything but my washing, said the barge woman. There's a heap of things of mine that you'll find in a corner of the cabin. If you'll just take one or two of the most necessary sort... I won't venture to describe them to a lady like you, but you'll recognise them at a glance, and put them through the wash tub as we go along. Why, it'll be a pleasure to you, as you rightly say, and a real help to me. Here, yeah, you let me steer, said Toad, now thoroughly frightened, and then you can get on with your washing your own way. I might spoil your things or not do them as you like. I, I'm more used to gentlemen's things myself. It's my special line. Let you steer, replied the barge woman, laughing. It's dull work, and I want you to be happy. Don't try and deprive me of the pleasure of giving you a treat. Toad was fairly cornered. He looked for escape this way and that, saw that he was far too far from the bank for a flying leap, and sullenly resigned himself to his fate. He fetched tub, soap, and other necessaries from the cabin, selected a few garments at random, tried to recollect what he had seen in casual glances through laundry windows, and set to... A long half-hour passed, and every minute of it saw Toad getting crosser and crosser. Nothing that he could do to the things seemed to please them or do them good. He tried coaxing, he tried slapping, he tried punching. His back ached badly, and he noticed with dismay that his paws were beginning to get all crinkly. A burst of laughter made him straighten himself and look round. The barge woman was leaning back and laughing unrestrainedly till the tears ran down her cheeks. Oh, I've been watching you all the time, she gasped. Pretty washerwoman you are. Never washed as much as a dish clout in your life, I lay. Toad's temper, which had been simmering viciously for some time, now fairly boiled over, and he lost all control of himself. You common, low, fat barge woman, he shouted. Don't you dare to talk to your betters like that. Washerwoman indeed, I would have you to know that I am a toad, a very well-known, respected, distinguished toad. The woman moved nearer to him and peered under his bonnet keenly and closely. Why, so you are, she cried. Well, I never, a horrid, nasty, crawly toad, and in my nice clean barge too. Now that is a thing that I will not have. She relinquished the tiller for a moment. One big mottled arm shot out and caught Toad by a foreleg, while the other gripped him fast by a hind leg. Then the world turned suddenly upside down. The barge seemed to flit lightly across the sky. The wind whistled in his ears, and Toad found himself flying through the air, revolving rapidly as he went. The water, when he eventually reached it with a loud splash, proved quite cold enough for his taste, though its chill was not sufficient to quell his proud spirit or slake the heat of his furious temper. He rose to the surface spluttering, 
and when he had wiped the duckweed out of his eyes, the first thing he saw was the fat bargewoman looking back at him over the stern of the retreating barge and laughing, and he vowed, as he coughed and choked, to be even with her. He struck out for the shore, but the cotton gown greatly impeded his efforts, and when at length he touched land, he found it hard to climb up the steep bank unassisted. He had to take a minute or two's rest to recover his breath, then, gathering his wet skirts well over his arms, he started to run after the barge as fast as his legs would carry him, wild with indignation, thirsting for revenge. The bargewoman was still laughing when he drew up level with her. Oh, put yourself through your mangle, washerwoman, she called out, <laughs> and iron your face and crimp it, and you'll pass for quite a decent looking toad. <laughs> toad never paused to reply. He saw what he wanted ahead of him. Running swiftly on, he overtook the horse, unfastened the tow rope and cast off, jumped lightly on the horse's back and urged it to a gallop by kicking it vigorously in the sides. He steered for the open country, abandoning the towpath and swinging his steed down a rutty lane. Once he looked back and saw that the barge had run aground on the other side of the canal and the barge woman was gesticulating wildly and shouting, Stop! 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 I've heard that song before, said Toad, laughing. The barge horse was not capable of any very sustained effort, and its gallop soon subsided into a trot, and its trot into an easy walk. But Toad was quite contented with this, knowing that he, at any rate, was moving, and the barge was not. He had quite recovered his temper, now that he had done something he thought really clever, and he was satisfied to jog along quietly in the sun, steering his horse along byways and bridle paths and trying to forget how very long it was since he had had a square meal till the canal had been left very far behind him. He had travelled some miles, his horse and he, and he was feeling drowsy in the hot sunshine when the horse stopped, lowered his head and began to nibble the grass. Toad looked about him and found he was on a wide common, dotted with patches of gorse and bramble as far as he could see. Near him stood a dingy gypsy caravan, and beside it a man was sitting on a bucket turned upside down, very busy smoking and staring into the wide world. A fire of sticks was burning nearby, and over the fire hung an iron pot, and out of that pot came forth bubblings and gurglings and a vague, suggestive steaminess. Also smells, warm, rich and varied smells that twined and twisted and wreathed themselves at last into one complete, voluptuous, perfect smell. Toad sat and sniffed and sniffed and looked at the gypsy, and the gypsy sat and smoked and looked at him. Presently the gypsy took his pipe out of his mouth and remarked in a careless way, Want to sell that there horse of yours? Toad was completely taken aback. It had not occurred to him to turn the horse into cash, but the gypsy's suggestion seemed to smooth the way towards the two things he wanted so badly, ready money and a solid breakfast. Oh, what? he said. Me sell this beautiful young horse of mine? Oh, no, it's out of the question. Who's going to take the washing home to my customers every week? Besides, I'm too fond of him and he simply dotes on me. All the same... Uh, how much might you be disposed to offer me for this beautiful young horse of mine? The gypsy looked the horse over, and then he looked Toad over with equal care, and looked at the horse again. Shilling a leg, he said briefly. A shilling a leg? cried Toad. Oh, no, I could not think of accepting four shillings for this beautiful young horse of mine. Well, said the gypsy, I'll tell you what I will do. I'll make it five shillings, and that's three and sixpence more than the animal's worth, and that's my last word. Then Toad sat and pondered long and deeply. At last he said firmly, Look here, Gypsy, I tell you what we will do, and this is my last word. You shall hand me over six shillings and sixpence cash down, and further, in addition thereto, you shall give me as much breakfast as I can possibly eat, at one sitting, of course, out of that iron pot of yours that keeps sending forth such delicious and exciting smells. In return, I will make over to you my spirited young horse, 
with all the beautiful harness and trappings. The gypsy grumbled frightfully and declared if he did a few more deals of that sort, he'd be ruined. But in the end, he lugged a dirty canvas bag out of the depths of his trouser pocket and counted out six shillings and sixpence into Toad's paw. Then he disappeared into the caravan for an instant and returned with a large iron plate and a knife, fork and spoon. He tilted up the pot and a glorious stream of hot, rich stew gurgled into the plate. Toad took the plate on his lap, almost crying, and stuffed and stuffed and stuffed. When Toad had taken as much stew on board as he thought he could possibly hold, he got up and said goodbye to the gypsy and took an affectionate farewell of the horse. And the gypsy, who knew the riverside well, gave him directions which way to go, and he set forth on his travels again in the best possible spirits. He was indeed a very different Toad from the animal of an hour ago. But his pride was shortly to have a severe fall. After some miles of country lanes, he reached the high road, and as he turned into it and glanced along its white length, he saw approaching him a speck that turned into a dot and then into a blob and then into something very familiar and a double note of warning only too well known fell on his delighted ear. This is something like, said the excited toad. I will hail them, my brothers of the wheel, and pitch them a yarn of the sort that has been so successful hitherto. And they will give me a lift, of course, and perhaps, with luck, it may even end in my driving up to Toad Hall in a motor car. That will be one in the eye of a badger. He stepped confidently out into the road to hail the motor car, which came along at an easy pace, slowing down as it neared the lane, when suddenly he became very pale. His heart turned to water. His knees shook and yielded under him, and he doubled up and collapsed with a sickening pain in his interior. And well he might, the unhappy animal, for the approaching car was the very one he had stolen out of the yard of the Red Lion Hotel on that fatal day when all his troubles began. And the people in it were the very same people he had sat and watched at luncheon in the coffee room. He sank down in a shabby, miserable heap in the road. The terrible motor car drew slowly nearer and nearer till at last he heard it stop just short of him. Two gentlemen got out, and one of them said, Oh dear, this is very sad. Here is a poor old thing, a washerwoman apparently, who was fainted in the road. Perhaps she is overcome by the heat, poor creature, or perhaps she has not had any food today. Let us lift her into the car and take her to the nearest village, where doubtless she has friends. They tenderly lifted Toad into the motor car, and propped him up with soft cushions and proceeded on their way. When Toad heard them talk in so kind and sympathetic a way, and knew that he was not recognised, his courage began to revive, and he cautiously opened first one eye and then the other. Look, said one of the gentlemen, she is better already. The fresh air is doing her good. How do you feel now, ma'am? Uh, thank you kindly, sir, said Toad in a feeble voice. I'm feeling a great deal better. I was only thinking if I might sit on the front seat there, beside the driver, where I could get the fresh air full in my face, I, I should soon be all right again. <laughs> what a sensible woman, said the gentleman. Of course you shall. So they carefully helped Toad into the front seat beside the driver, and on they went again. Toad was almost himself again by now. He sat up looked about him and tried to beat down the old cravings that rose up and beset him and took possession of him entirely. He turned to the driver at his side. Uh, please, sir, he said, I wish you would kindly let me try and drive the car for a little. I've been watching you carefully and it looks so easy and so interesting and I should like to be able to tell my friends that once I had driven a motor car. <laughs> The driver laughed at the proposal so heartily that the gentleman inquired what the matter was. When he heard, he said to Toad's delight, Bravo, ma'am, I like your spirit. Let her have a try and look after her. She won't do any harm. Toad eagerly scrambled into the seat vacated by the driver, took the steering wheel in his hands, listened with affected humility to the instructions given him, and set the car in motion, but very slowly and carefully at first, for he was determined to be prudent. The gentlemen behind clapped their hands and applauded, and Toad heard them saying, 
How well she does it. Fancy a washerwoman driving a car as well as that. The first time. Toad went a little faster, then faster still, and faster. He heard the gentleman call out warningly, Be careful, washerwoman, and this annoyed him, and he began to lose his head. The driver tried to interfere, but he pinned him down in his seat with one elbow and put on full speed. The rush of air in his face, the hum of the engines, and the light jump of the car beneath him intoxicated his weak brain. Washerwoman, indeed! He shouted recklessly, Ho, ho! I am the toad, the motor car snatcher! The prison breaker, the toad who always escapes, sit still, and you shall know what driving really is, for you are in the hands of the famous, the skillful, the entirely fearless toad. With a cry of horror, the whole party rose and flung themselves on him. Seize him, they cried. Alas, they should have been more prudent. With a half turn of the wheel, the toad sent the car crashing through a low hedge that ran along the roadside. One mighty bound, a violent shock, and the wheels of the car were churning up the thick mud of a horse pond. Toad found himself flying through the air with the delicate curve of a swallow. He landed on his back with a thump in the soft, rich grass of a meadow. Sitting up, he could just see the motor car in the pond nearly submerged. The gentleman and the driver, encumbered by their long coats, were floundering helplessly in the water. He picked himself up rapidly and set off running across the country as hard as he could, scrambling through hedges, jumping ditches, pounding across fields, till he was breathless and weary and had to settle down into an easy walk. When he had recovered his breath somewhat and was able to think calmly, he began to giggle, and from giggling he took to laughing, and he laughed till he had to sit down under a hedge. A slight noise at a distance behind him made him turn his head and look. Oh, horror! Oh, misery! Oh, despair! About two fields off, a chauffeur in his leather gaiters and two large rural policemen were visible, running towards him as hard as they could go. Poor Toad sprang to his feet and pelted away again, his heart in his mouth. He glanced back and saw to his dismay that they were gaining on him. He did his best, but he was a fat animal, and his legs were short, and still they gained. He could hear them close behind him now. Suddenly the earth failed under his feet. He grasped at the air, and splash! He found himself head over heels in deep water, rapid water, water that bore him along with a force he could not contend with, and he knew that in his blind panic he had run straight into the river. Down he went, and came up breathless and spluttering. Presently he saw that he was approaching a big dark hole in the bank just above his head, and as the stream bore him past, he reached up with a paw and caught hold of the edge and held on. Then, slowly and with difficulty, he drew himself up out of the water. As he sighed and blew and stared before him into the dark hole, some bright, small thing shone and twinkled in its depths, moving towards him. As it approached, a face grew up gradually around it, and it was a familiar face, brown and small, with whiskers, grave and round, with neat ears and silky hair. It was the water rat. The rat put out a neat little brown paw, gripped Toad firmly by the scruff of the neck, and gave a great hoist and a pull, and the waterlogged Toad came up slowly but surely over the edge of the hole till at last he stood safe and sound in the hall. Streaked with mud and weed, to be sure, and with the water streaming off him, but happy and high-spirited as of old, now that he found himself once more in the house of a friend, and he could lay aside a disguise that was unworthy of his position. Oh, ratty! he cried. I've been through such times since I saw you last. You can't think such trials, such sufferings, and all so nobly born. Then such escapes, such disguises, such subterfuges, and all so cleverly planned and carried out. Oh, I am a smart toad and no mistake. Just hold on till I tell you, toad, said the water rat gravely and firmly. You go off upstairs at once and take off that old cotton rag that looks as if it might formerly have belonged to some washerwoman and clean yourself thoroughly, and put on some of my clothes, and try and calm down looking like a gentleman if you can. For a more shabby, bedraggled, disreputable-looking object than you are, I never set eyes on in my whole life. 
Now stop swaggering and arguing and be off. I'll have something to say to you later. By the time Toad came downstairs again, luncheon was on the table. While they ate, Toad told the rat all his adventures, dwelling chiefly on his own cleverness and presence of mind in emergencies and cunning in tight places. But the more he talked and boasted, the more grave and silent the rat became. When at last Toad had talked himself to a standstill, there was silence for a while, and then the rat said, Now, Toadie, I don't want to give you pain after all you've been through already, but seriously, don't you see what an awful ass you've been making of yourself? On your own admission, you've been handcuffed, imprisoned, starved, chased, terrified out of your life, insulted, jeered at, and ignominiously flung into the water. By a woman, too. When are you going to be sensible and think of your friends and try to be a credit to them? Toad heaved a deep sigh and said very nicely and humbly, Quite right, Ratty. How sound you always are. Yes, I've been a conceited old ass. I can quite see that. But now I'm going to be a good toad and not do it any more. We'll have our coffee and a smoke and a quiet chat, and then I'm going to stroll quietly down to Toad Hall and get into clothes of my own and set things going again on the old lines. I've had enough of adventures. I shall lead a quiet and steady, respectable life and pottering about my property and improving it and doing a little landscape gardening at times, just as I used to in the good old days before I got restless and wanted to do things. Stroll quietly down to Toad Hall, cried the rat, greatly excited. What are you talking about? You mean to say you haven't heard? Heard what? said Toad, turning rather pale. Go on, Ratty, quick, don't spare me. What haven't I heard? Do you mean to tell me, shouted the Rat, thumping with his little fist upon the table, that you've heard nothing about the stoats and weasels, and how they've been and taken Toad Hall? Toad leaned his elbows on the table, and his chin on his paws, and a large tear welled up in each of his eyes, overflowed, and splashed on the table. Yes. <laughs> Go on, Ratty, he murmured presently. Tell me all. I can bear it. When you got into that, that trouble of yours, said the Rat, well, it was a good deal talked about down here naturally, not only along the riverside, but even in the wild wood. And the wild wood animals got very cocky and went about saying you were done for this time. You would never come back again. Never, never. But Mole and Badger, they stuck out through thick and thin that you would come back again soon, somehow. They arranged to move their things into Toad Hall and sleep there and keep it aired and have it all ready for you when you turned up. One dark night, a band of weasels, armed to the teeth, crept silently up the carriage drive to the front entrance. Simultaneously, a body of desperate ferrets, advancing through the kitchen garden, possessed themselves of the backyard and offices while a company of skirmishing stoats who stuck at nothing occupied the conservatory and the billiard room and held the French windows opening onto the lawn. The mole and badger were sitting by the fire in the smoking room, telling stories and suspecting nothing, when those bloodthirsty villains broke down the doors and rushed in upon them from every side. They made the best fight they could, but what was the good? They were unarmed and taken by surprise, and what can two animals do against hundreds? They took and beat them severely with sticks, those two poor faithful creatures, and turned them out into the cold and the wet with many insulting and uncalled for remarks. And the wild wooders have been living in Toad Hall ever since, and going on simply anyhow, eating your grub, drinking your drink, making bad jokes about you, and singing vulgar songs about, well, about prisons and magistrates and policemen. And they're telling the tradespeople and everybody that they've come to stay for good. Oh, have they? said Toad, getting up and seizing a stick. I'll jolly soon see about that. It's no good, Toad. We can do nothing until we have seen the mole and the badger and heard their latest news. While you were riding about the country in expensive motor cars and galloping proudly on blood horses and breakfasting on the fat of the land, those two poor devoted animals have been camping out in the open in every sort of weather, living very rough by day and lying very hard by night, watching over your house, patrolling your boundaries, keeping a constant eye on the stoats and the weasels, scheming and planning and contriving how to get your property back for you. You don't deserve to have such true and loyal friends, Toad. You don't, really. <laughs> I'm an ungrateful beast, I know, sobbed Toad, shedding bitter tears. 
there came a heavy knock at the door. Toad was nervous, but the rat, nodding mysteriously at him, went straight up to the door and opened it, and in walked Mr. Badger. He came solemnly up to Toad, shook him by the paw, and said, Welcome home, Toad. Oh, alas, what am I saying? Home, indeed. This is a poor homecoming, unhappy Toad. Presently there came another and a lighter knock. The rat, with a nod to Toad, went to the door and ushered in the mole, very shabby and unwashed, with bits of hay and straw sticking in his fur. Hooray! Here's old Toad, cried the mole, his face beaming. Fancy having you back again! And he began to dance round him. We never dreamed you would turn up so soon. Why, you must have managed to escape, you clever, ingenious, intelligent Toad. Clever? Oh, no, said Toad. I'm not really clever, according to my friends. I've only broken out of the strongest prison in England, that's all, and captured a railway train and escaped on it, that's all. Toad, do be quiet, please, said the rat, and don't you egg him on, Mole, but tell us as soon as possible what the position is. The position's about as bad as it can be, replied the Mole grumpily. The badger and I have been round and round the place by night and by day. Always the same thing, sentries posted everywhere, guns poked out at us, stones thrown at us, always an animal on the lookout. The badger got up from his seat and stood before the fireplace, reflecting deeply. At last he spoke. What the mole says is quite true. The stoats are on guard at every point. It's quite useless to think of attacking the place. They're too strong for us. Then, then it's all over, sobbed the toad. Come, cheer up, toady, said the badger. I'm going to tell you a great secret. There is an underground passage that leads from the river bank, quite near here, right up into the middle of Toad Hall. Oh, nonsense, Badger, said Toad rather airily. I know every inch of Toad Hall inside and out. Nothing of the sort, I do assure you. My young friend, said the Badger with great severity, your father, who was a worthy animal, was a particular friend of mine and told me a great deal he wouldn't have dreamed of telling you. He discovered that passage, and he repaired it and cleaned it out because he thought it might come in useful some day, in case of trouble or danger, and he showed it to me. Don't let my son know about it, he said. He's a good boy, but very light and volatile in character, and simply cannot hold his tongue. If he's ever in a real fix, and it would be of use to him, you may tell him about the secret passage, but not before. There's going to be a big banquet tomorrow night, and all the weasels will be gathered together in the dining hall, eating and drinking and laughing and carrying on, suspecting nothing. No guns, no swords, no sticks, no arms of any sort whatever. And that is where the passage comes in. That very useful tunnel leads right up under the butler's pantry next to the dining hall. We shall creep out quietly into the butler's pantry, cried the mole. With our pistols and swords and sticks, shouted the rat. And rush in upon them, said the badger. And whack em, and whack em, and whack em, cried the toad in ecstasy, running round and round the room and jumping over the chairs. Very well then, said the badger. Our plan is settled. We will make all the necessary arrangements tomorrow. Next day, when it began to grow dark, the rat, with an air of excitement and mystery, summoned them into the parlour and proceeded to dress them up for the coming expedition. He was very earnest about it, and the affair took quite a long time. First there was a belt to go round each animal, and then a sword to be stuck into each belt, and then a cutlass on the other side to balance it. Then a pair of pistols, a policeman's truncheon, several sets of handcuffs, some bandages and sticking plaster, and a flask, and a sandwich case. The badger laughed good-humouredly and said, <laughs> I'm going to do all I've got to do with this here stick. But the rat only said, oh, Please, badger, you know I shouldn't like you to blame me afterwards and say I'd forgotten anything. The badger led them along by the river for a little way, and then suddenly swung himself over the edge into a hole in the river bank, a little above the water. The mole and the rat followed silently, swinging themselves successfully into the hole as they had seen the badger do. But when it came to Toad's turn, of course, 
he managed to slip and fall into the water with a loud splash and a squeal of alarm. He was hauled out by his friends, rubbed down and wrung out hastily, comforted and set on his legs. But the badger was seriously angry and told him that the very next time he made a fool of himself, he would most certainly be left behind. So, at last, they were in the secret passage. It was cold and dark and damp and low and narrow, and poor Toad began to shiver, partly from dread of what might be before him, partly because he was wet through. They groped and shuffled along, with their ears pricked up and their paws on their pistols, till at last the badger said, We ought by now to be pretty nearly under the hall. Then, suddenly, they heard, far away as it might be, and yet apparently nearly over their heads, a confused murmur of sound, as if people were shouting and cheering and stamping on the floor and hammering on tables. The toad's nervous terrors all returned, but the badger only remarked placidly, They are going it, the weasels. They groped onward a little further, and then the noise broke out again, quite distinct this time and very close above them. What a time they're having, said the badger. Come on. They hurried along the passage till it came to a full stop, and they found themselves standing under the trap door that led up into the butler's pantry. The badger said, Now, boys, all together. And the four of them put their shoulders to the trap door and heaved it back. Hoisting each other up, they found themselves standing in the pantry, with only a door between them and the banqueting hall, where their enemies were carousing. The noise was simply deafening. Get ready, all of you, said the badger. He drew himself up, took a firm grip on his stick with both paws, glanced round at his comrades and cried, The hour is come! Follow me! and flung the door open wide. What a squealing and a squeaking and a screeching filled the air! Well might the terrified weasels dive under the tables and spring madly up at the windows. Well might the ferrets rush wildly for the fireplace and get hopelessly jammed in the chimney. Well might tables and chairs be upset, and glass and china be sent crashing on the floor in the panic of that terrible moment when the four heroes strode wrathfully into the room. The mighty badger, his whiskers bristling, his great cudgel whistling through the air. Mole, black and grim, brandishing his stick and shouting his awful war cry, A mole! A mole! Rat, desperate and determined, his belt bulging with weapons of every age and every variety. Toad, frenzied with excitement and injured pride, swollen to twice his ordinary size, leaping into the air and emitting toad whoops that chill them to the marrow. They were but four in all, but to the panic-stricken weasels the hall seemed full of monstrous animals, grey, black, brown and yellow, whooping and flourishing enormous cudgels, and they broke and fled with squeals of terror and dismay, this way and that, through the windows, up the chimney, anywhere to get out of the reach of those terrible sticks. The affair was soon over. Up and down the whole length of the hall strode the four friends, whacking with their sticks at every head that showed itself, and in five minutes the room was cleared. Through the broken windows the shrieks of terrified weasels escaping across the lawn were borne faintly to their ears. On the floor lay prostrate some dozen or so of the enemy, on whom the mole was busily engaged in fitting handcuffs. The badger, resting from his labours, leaned on his stick and wiped his honest brow. Mole, he said, I want you to take those fellows on the floor there upstairs with you and have some bedrooms cleaned out and tidied up and made really comfortable. And then you can put them out by the back door, and we shan't see any more of them, I fancy. The good-natured mole picked up a stick, formed his prisoners up in a line on the floor, gave them the order, quick march, and led his squad off to the upper floor. After a time, he appeared again, smiling, and said that every room was ready and as clean as a new pin. They ate their supper in great joy and contentment, and presently retired to rest. The following morning, Toad, who had overslept himself, as usual, came down to breakfast disgracefully late. Through the French windows of the breakfast room, he could see the mole and the water rat sitting in wicker chairs out on the lawn, evidently telling each other stories, roaring with laughter and kicking their short legs up in the air. The badger looked up when Toad entered the room. Toad, we really ought to have a banquet at once to celebrate this affair. It's expected of you. In fact, it's the rule. Oh, all right, said the Toad readily. Anything to oblige. The invitations will have to be written and got off at once, said the Badger. 
and you've got to write them. What? cried Toad, dismayed. Me? Stop indoors and write a lot of rotten letters on a jolly morning like this when I want to go around my property and set everything and everybody to rights and swagger about and enjoy myself? Certainly not. I'll be... I'll see you... Stop a minute, though. Why, of course, dear Badger, what is my pleasure or convenience compared with that of others? Eh? You wish it done, and it shall be done. The Badger looked at him very suspiciously, but Toad's frank, open countenance made it difficult to suggest any unworthy motive in this change of attitude. He quitted the room, accordingly, in the direction of the kitchen, and as soon as the door had closed behind him, Toad hurried to the writing table. He would write the invitations, and he would set out a sort of programme of entertainment for the evening. He sketched it out in his head. And speech by Toad. There will be other speeches by Toad during the evening. Address by Toad. Synopsis, our prison system. The waterways of old England. Horse dealing and how to deal. Property, its rights and its duties. Back to the land. A typical English squire. Song by Toad, composed by himself. Other compositions by Toad will be sung in the course of the evening by the composer. <laughs> the idea pleased him mightily, and he worked very hard and got all the letters finished by noon. When the other animals came back to luncheon, the mole looked doubtfully at Toad, expecting to find him sulky or depressed. Instead, he was so uppish and inflated that the mole began to suspect something, while the rat and the badger exchanged significant glances. As soon as the meal was over, Toad thrust his paws deep into his trouser pockets, remarked casually, Well, look after yourselves, you fellows, ask for anything you want, and was swaggering off in the direction of the garden, where he wanted to think out an idea or two for his coming speeches, when the rat caught him by the arm. Toad rather suspected what he was after, and did his best to get away, but when the badger took him firmly by the other arm, he began to see that the game was up. The two animals conducted him between them into the small smoking room, shut the door, and put him into a chair. Now, look here, Toad, said the rat. It's about this banquet, and very sorry I am to have to speak to you like this, but we want you to understand clearly, once and for all, that there are going to be no speeches and no songs. You know well that your songs are all conceit and boasting and vanity, and your speeches are all self-praise and, and, well, uh, and gross exaggeration, and, and, and gas, put in the badger in his common way. It's for your own good, Toady, went on the rat. You know you must turn over a new leaf sooner or later, and now seems a splendid time to begin, a sort of turning point in your career. Toad remained a long while plunged in thought. At last, he raised his head, and traces of strong emotion were visible on his features. You have conquered, my friends. You are right, I know, and I'm wrong. Henceforth, I will be a very different toad. My friends, you shall never have occasion to blush for me again. But, oh dear, oh dear, this is a hard world. And pressing his handkerchief to his face, he left the room with faltering footsteps. Toad went quietly down the stairs to greet his guests, who he knew must be assembling in the drawing room. All the animals cheered when he entered, and crowded round to congratulate him, and say nice things about his courage and his cleverness and his fighting qualities. But Toad only smiled faintly and murmured, Not at all, or sometimes for a change, On the contrary. The animals were evidently puzzled and taken aback by this unexpected attitude of his and Toad felt, as he moved from one guest to the other, making his modest responses, that he was an object of absorbing interest to everyone. The badger had ordered everything of the best, and the banquet was a great success. There was much talking and laughter and chaff among the animals, but through it all, Toad, who of course was in the chair, looked down his nose and murmured pleasant nothings to the animals on either side of him. At intervals, he stole a glance at the badger and the rat, and always when he looked, they were staring at each other 
with their mouths open, and this gave him the greatest satisfaction. Some of the younger and livelier animals, as the evening wore on, got whispering to each other that things were not so amusing as they used to be in the good old days, and there were some knockings on the table and cries of, Toad! Speech! Speech from Toad! Song! Mr. Toad's song! But Toad only shook his head gently, raised one paw in mild protest, and by pressing delicacies on his guests, by topical small talk, and by earnest inquiries after members of their families, not yet old enough to appear at social functions, managed to convey to them that this dinner was being run on strictly conventional lines. He was indeed an altered toad. After this climax, the four animals continued to lead their lives in great joy and contentment. Toad, after due consultation with his friends, selected a handsome gold chain and locket set with pearls which he dispatched to the jailer's daughter, with a letter that even the badger admitted to be modest, grateful and appreciative. And the engine driver, in his turn, was properly thanked and compensated for all his pains and trouble. Under severe compulsion from the badger, even the barge woman was, with some trouble, sought out and the value of her horse discreetly made good to her. Sometimes, in the course of long summer evenings, the friends would take a stroll together in the wild wood, now successfully tamed, so far as they were concerned, and it was pleasing to see how respectfully they were greeted by the inhabitants, and how the mother weasels would bring their young ones to the mouths of their holes, and say, pointing, Look, baby, there goes that great Mr. Toad, and that's the gallant water rat, a terrible fighter, walking along of him, and yonder comes the famous Mr. Mole, of whom you so often have heard your father tell. But when their infants were fractious and quite beyond control, they would quiet them by telling how, if they didn't hush them and not fret them, the terrible grey badger would up and get them. This was a base libel on Badger, who, though he cared little about society, was rather fond of children. But it never failed to have its full effect.